The first of the speakers is um, Professor Victor Mayer. Um, and Victor Mayer is one of the shining, many, there are many shining lights in Chinese studies, but for me, as a Chinese art historian, um, he is somebody who represents what the best of the field can be. Uh, that is to say, somebody who is courageous in the approaches and ta tackles new subjects and isn't afraid to um, think about things in ways that are different from the standards and challenge the standards and break new ground. Um, since 1979, he's been a professor at University of Pennsylvania. Um, pertinent, obviously, he's very well published. Um, pertinent today's, to today's event, he published this book, A True History, The True History of Tea, uh, published in uh, 2010, which my seminar students this quarter are studying. That we discussed this on Monday um, in the seminar that's focusing on Sino-Viet tea trade and culture to uh, open up a brand new area of study for my field. And so they're very excited about reading the book and having the chance to listen to Professor Mayer, and I know you are too. So I will bring Professor Mayer up to speak on tea perceived from a 9th century shipwreck to a 19th century snuff bottle, please. Thank you very much, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. There's nothing I like to talk about more than tea, and nothing I like to drink more than tea. Uh, but I, I didn't always like to drink tea. I didn't even know much about tea until I went to Nepal in the Peace Corps in 1965. And being in Nepal, I, um, I really appreciated tea because it got me through the very hot summers and the very cold winters. In the hot summer, uh, I would drink tea and it would make me perspire and that would cool me down. And in the cold winters, climbing up in the high mountains, I'd be freezing and I would uh, put a hot a cup of hot tea in my tummy and that would be like a furnace. So it, it, tea just really kind of helped me get through. But the way that uh, people in Nepal drink tea is uh, very much a British in the British way, and that's how I got used to it with um, red tea, black tea, and uh, milk and sugar. That's an abomination to people who like tea in East Asia, uh, but that's what I got used to. And then after um, I became a sinologist, I started was very much interested in the history of tea. And uh, I, I, the reason I wrote a book called The True History of Tea because I thought most of the other histories of tea were false. They were saying a lot of things that weren't true. For example, like Chinese people were drinking tea for 5,000 years. So many things in China have been around for 5,000 years. Uh, but the more I read Chinese history books and the um, more I studied the botany of tea I realized that it was impossible that Chinese could have been drinking tea for 5,000 years. Uh, this will come as a shock to many of you in this room. Uh, but there's no evidence for it. And uh, really, what I found out from looking at the history, that Chinese people have not been drinking tea uh, for more than about uh, 1,200, 1,300 years, except in the far southwest. So uh, I knew this from studying the historical documents, uh, but then I, I thought, I have to write a book about this. And so about 30 years ago, I started to write that book, but I never finished it because uh, it was a big job and I had too many other things to do. And the history of tea was just sort of like a, um, a very serious avocational interest. But finally, uh, I said, I've got to finish this book. And so I, I joined together with uh, Arling Ho, who's a Swedish journalist. And we finished it off within about two or three years. Now, as I was um, doing the final research for that book, uh, the book had basically already been written. But I was just checking around on the internet, seeing if there's any additional information. 
any additional new evidence. And I, I was stunned because I came upon this um, tea bowl that had been uh, discovered in a, a, a shipwreck off the coast of, um, between Borneo and Sumatra. I'll show you where that is. Okay, do we have a laser pointer somewhere? No? If anybody comes up with a laser pointer, run up here. But uh, I'm, I'll, right now we have a, a thing sticking in that island in the mi middle. You see the mark? Okay, that island is Belitung. And uh, to the right is Borneo, to the left is Sumatra. Okay, there was a shipwreck off the coast of Belitung there. And it was discovered in 1998 by uh, sea cucumber fishermen. And these objects from this shipwreck started to show up in the antiquities market in Singapore. And eventually, a couple of German um, explorers uh, excavated the site, conserved the pieces, and um, they ended up in Singapore. Now, there was a lot of controversy over who owned them, uh, how they should be de exhibited, but fortunately, I'm very, very glad that um, the collection stayed together, except for, oh, thank you very much. Which button do I push? Okay, thank you very much, yeah. Uh, 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 now, come on. It's not, oh, there it is, yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, the collection was kept together as one unit, and it's worth a lot, a lot of money. Um, and I, I'll just put it this way, a consortium in Singapore, a very highly connected consortium in Singapore, spent tens of millions of dollars to purchase it. And so I, I got to see the collection when it was still housed in warehouses in Singapore, uh, guarded by soldiers with machine guns. And, but there was, okay, there are about 60,000 items in this collection, 60,000. It's like a time capsule, the Tang Dynasty, because the, there's um, a dated object uh, that's 826. So we know the shipwreck went down after 826, it's probably around 830, the year 830. Very, very important for the history of tea. And uh, one of the bowls is, there were 50,000 bowls and some other things too, but one of the bowl has the word for tea on it, except it's written in a very special way, and I'll show you that in a moment. <laughs> so this, finding out about that tea bowl, that it just was shocking to me, stunning, because it was like the last piece of evidence I needed to put together for my argument. Uh, that tea drinking in China did not become popular until by, after around the middle of the ninth century. And so I was shocked that, that I actually got this information a couple, just a couple months before the book was supposed to go to press. And my co-author, uh, Arling Ho, was a little incredulous. He said, this is too good to be true. But it really was dug up from the bottom of the sea, brought up from the bottom of the sea. And I'll get to show you. It was one of the thrills of my life when I found out about this. Uh, people still don't talk about it that much except me, because it's so incredibly important for the history of tea. Now, as, as you're starting to glean, I'm a philologist. I'm very much interested in the history of language um, and linguistics. So I'm going to teach, I, I wanted you to learn two words of Chinese today. Uh, the first word is, has to do with um, the tea tasting we had this morning. This is one of my favorite words in Chinese. I don't know if everybody here who is, speaks Chinese uses this word very often, but I do a lot. Hui Wei. Where's the tea master? There, you know the word Hui Wei, right? Okay. Okay, so Wei 
means taste or flavor. And hui wei means return the flavor, taste or flavor. So when I have a very fine cup of tea, I return the flavor for hours later. In English, I think we could probably say savor. I don't know if that's the best translation, but it means return the flavor. And I really, it, it, this morning after I was drinking those very fine teas, I, I couldn't believe how the tea flavor lingered in my mouth and, and just sort of transformed into different kind of sensory feelings. So the other word I want you to learn today is the Chinese word for tea. All the words in the world for tea ultimately come from Chinese, except one. And I won't answer, I'll tell you what that is until the Q&A period if somebody's interested. So most words in the, in the world for tea can be divided into three manifestations of the Chinese word. So we, we usually know, well, in English we say tea, right? Okay, that comes from Fujian, Fujianese, Fujian, Minnan, Chinese language. And that's te, te. Okay. So that's where we get our word tea. And so the, many of the words in the world for tea are basically this uh, Fujianese word, Hokkien. But we also have words like in Japanese, um, Indian languages. Vietnamese, Korean, the sound like cha, right? Cha. Mandarin is cha. Uh, so we have tea, cha, and then there's one other manifestation of the Chinese word for tea, and that is chai. And chai has become very popular in America too, right? So uh, chai is, um, we know of it mainly as masala chai, right? Spice tea, Indian, that's an Indian word for tea. Okay, so it, it gets really crazy because I have to tell you, when I started writing this book, I thought, you know, I'm kind of like an Indophile, you know, okay. I, I you know, I love things Indian and, uh, I, you know, Nepal is very much in the Indo-Iranian, in Indic sphere of culture. So, I, honestly, I thought, I'm going to write this book about tea, and I'm going to prove that tea came from India. And I started to do all this research, and I got really bummed out, <laughs> totally deflated, because I couldn't even find a Sanskrit word for tea. Oh my gosh. I just was crushed. And then even worse, uh, let me see, we have somebody in the room who used to be the representative uh, Lipton Tea. Where is he? Peter, there he is. He was the tea taster for Lipton's for 30 years. And um, well, you know, Lipton's is a great seller of tea all over the world. But guess what? It was, a, it was probably Lipton itself that taught the Indians how to drink tea. That's mind-boggling. That that the British basically taught the Indians how to drink tea. About three or four hundred years after they learned to drink tea. So the British were the head of the Indians. So my, my theory about um, India being the homeland of tea drinking was just totally, totally shot out of the water. So then I had to go looking like, well, if it didn't come from India and it didn't come from China very early on, where did it come from? But I, I do want to say that even though the Chinese didn't begin the use, utilization of tea, the Chinese are definitely responsible for uh, people drinking tea as an infusion. Because before tea was used as an infusion, uh, a beverage, a beverage that perks you up, 
Uh, tea was used in Southeast Asia, and I'm going to tell you where the botanical homeland of tea is. It's in southernmost Yunnan, uh, northwestern Laos, northeastern uh, Burma. So it's like golden botanical tree, uh, triangle of, it's like a hothouse for plants. So that, that's where the botanical, we know this from genetic studies and also from the, the nature of the plant, that it's, that's where it begins. And that, that region stretches all, over to, uh, all the way over toward Assam, northeastern India. So that's where the tea plant grows naturally and native. And in those places, it looks like a tree. I mean, it is a tree. It's a tall, it's like 20, 30 feet high. And of course, we know tea as a shrub or a bush, which is about like this, and very easy for picking. So what the Chinese did was they domesticated the plant. They made, um, they commercialized the plant. They um, invented the uh, drinking of tea as an infusion. But what was tea before it was in a, a beverage infused? an infused beverage. It was, um, well, one thing, if any of you ha know anything about Burmese restaurants, I hear there's a Burmese restaurant in uh, San Francisco that serves fermented tea salad. Okay, so the, the ancient people in Southeast Asia, they just let the tea plant grow wild. And they would go out and climb up the trees and pick, it, pick the tea leaves off the tree. And they still do that now, for example, the best quality of the best puar tea in southern Yunnan. Some of you know about puar teas. Uh, they, they shinny up the trees and pick it that way. They don't pick it like domesticated tea. The, the Chinese do. Now, you, you have to also understand that the ecology of the tea plant is such that it's tropical or subtropical. So, its boundaries have been forced north. That's why it doesn't grow so luxuriantly in the north. It, it's not going to grow into tea, uh, trees. Uh, but the, it, so the plant was domesticated by the Chinese. It was commercialized. Uh, they invented how to drink tea. And later in this uh, lecture, I've got to watch my time. OK. Uh, they. I will tell you, the very guy, the very person, I think, who's responsible for changing tea from a barbarian southern drink. That's one of the reasons I had my doubts about Chinese drinking tea for 5,000 years. Because uh, as late as the sixth century, very reliable texts said that the Chinese thought tea was a barbarian drink from the south. And that, that's from the kind of text that I couldn't ignore. So I was so overwhelmed and so happy when I found out about this bowl that was on the shipwreck, dated to 826, about 830, because uh, the evidence on that bowl is exactly what I needed to conclude my argument about the development of the word for tea in Chinese. So I, I, I wrote a very uh, linguistically, philologically dense appendix for that book. It's Appendix C, and it's all about the character and the word for tea in Chinese. Um, so I spent about six months writing that appendix and uh, I sent it off to the publisher, and the publisher said, sorry, it's too scholarly. We can't even have it in the book. As, and I said, over my dead body. I spent half a year of my life, and this is so important, so it's going to be in the book. And then we had, like, a standoff. And then I wasn't going to budge. And so finally, the publisher, Thames and Hudson, it's a very good publisher, they, uh, they said, OK, we'll compromise. We're going to put it in eight-point type double columns. <laughs> so normal human beings can't read that. 
small. So I, I just tell all of you, take it to your photocopier, blow it up 200%. <laughs> then you can read it. And it's worth reading, OK? Let's go look at this ship some more. Oh, yeah. So there's what all these bowls and things look like on the bottom of the sea. Uh, the bowls, all these, t now, I'm going to have a tendency to say tea bowl, but they weren't tea bowls. I'm sorry, one of the bowls out of those 50,000 bowls says tea on it. It says tea bowl, but it's false. Because, okay, these this shipwreck was going off to the Middle East, probably to what we call Oman now, you know, that area. The ship itself was of Arabic construction, what we would call a dhow. Do you know that? D-H-O-W. It didn't have a nail in it, not a piece of metal. It was just strung together with choir palm fibers. And it wasn't very long, about from that wall, about five feet beyond the stage, and maybe 20 feet wide. But they packed everything in there so densely uh, that um, they squeezed a huge amount of material into that. Now, it was being shipped off to the Middle East somewhere. The ship was of a Middle Eastern and Indian construction. The lumber was from uh, Middle East and India. And probably the crew was also, but they were carrying things from China. And the main thing that they were carrying were all these bowls, plus a few very expensive artifacts. We don't know why, whether these were trade. They, they were, must have been trading, just like the Chinese are trading now, right? Uh, great entrepreneurs manufacturers and entrepreneurs say so they were sending these bowls off to the Middle East. Why do I know that they couldn't be tea bowls? Because the people in the Middle East weren't drinking tea then either. The Chinese barely had begun to drink tea. People in the Middle East wouldn't be drinking tea for many centuries yet. So they weren't sending these bowls to the Middle East for, as tea bowls. They were just, I would just call them all-purpose small bowls. <laughs> But, but they are very interesting because they have, now talking about sensory perceptions and artist, art, artistry, they have 50,000 bowls or more, and each one is decorated in a separate way. They, they, they're all done freestyle. Okay, there's very, there are very few of the bowls that have Chinese writing on them. This is one, the calligraphy is undistinguished. Now, a very interesting thing is that it has, it looks like it's Arabic. Uh, okay, they were sending these things off to um, Middle East. Why not? But guess what? It's pseudo-Arabic. It's fake Arabic. They, they knew what Arabic looked like, sort of, but they didn't know how to write real Arabic. Now, there were a lot of Persians and Arabs in China around this time, 9th century, 8th century. So they, they had contact with Arabs and Persians, people who used the Arabic script. But um, this, it looks sort of like Allah, which would make, be a good thing to write, I guess. Uh, but... My Arabic colleague at Penn just a few weeks ago helped me to figure out that basically these are vegetable, vegetal motifs. Uh, and so this is just an elaboration of those same kind of strokes. Anyway, it's not real Arabic writing. I, can't, I couldn't get any Arabic specialist to be able to read this. And there's another one. So there were, there were a few of these. Now, there were some bowls on the ship that were very expensive, very high quality, probably about 300 items. There's one, yeah, where? And they came from different kilns, by the way. Uh, those 50,000 plus um, all-purpose bowls came from a kiln near Changsha in Hunan. 
these came from other kilns that made the higher quality uh, porcelain, ceramics. There's whiteware. These, would, these are all worth a lot of money now. And there's green splashed ware. Now, this is very, very special because it's got blue, it's blue and white. And this dates from the middle of the ninth century. Now, before the discovery of this shipwreck, the earliest blue and white, which is very special in China, uh, we knew of was from the Mongol Yuan period. And that makes sense because the, the mineral, this indigo uh, mineral dye comes from the Middle East. It's not known in China. So they had to import this mineral, and, and, and it, it came when the uh, Mongols had conquered all of Eurasia, practically, and they brought back workmen and they brought back the technology to make this kind of uh, color. But the, here, here we have it four centuries earlier, five centuries earlier. So this was quite a stunning discovery on this ship. Then there are also uh, some Sasanian silver items, but they, they, the motifs, the, the design are Sasanian, Persian, but they, this is probably made in China on so Sasanian motifs. This uh, glass probably comes from Syria, but it, it's, isn't that interesting? Because it came from Syria, went to China, and now it's getting shipped back to the Middle East. So it's a, a prestige, precious item. And it was pro uh, some of us think that maybe the, the very high quality goods were being sent to some potentate in the Middle East, you know, the marriage of a prince uh, or something like that. So there were some very, very expensive items, but mostly it was for trade. There are a few antique uh, Chinese mirrors of high quality, some of them uh, quite ancient, so they were collector's items. And then we have this huge golden platter, and you can see what's in the middle of it. It's not shocking, because that was a very common symbol, uh, especially in Buddhism. And this, this one is very interesting because um, I saw, the, this comes out of the shipwreck, but I saw the exact same cup dug out of the ground in Xi'an about 10 years ago. So they, they made several of these. And it wasn't imported from uh, Central Asia or the Middle East. Although all of the this, musicians, these are musicians, that's like a pipa or biwa, you know that. Uh, uh, an oud, maybe you could say. But they're, they're a group of music, musicians, and I was really shocked when, in, about 10 years ago when I was at an archaeological site in Xi'an, which is um, the ancient Chang'an, and, and I, I held one just like that. that was dug up out of the earth. But this one comes from the bottom of the sea. So, you know, when you get two pieces like that, that, that's really strong confirmation that they're genuine. They have to be genuine anyway, if you see it dug out of the earth and brought up from the sea. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you this, um, the bowl that's so important for me. I, do I still have five minutes or seven minutes? Yes, five. Okay, five or six. <laughs> okay, there I am holding this priceless bowl. I mean, okay, so I've, I learned about the bowl when I was Sweden, in Sweden finishing, uh, just by chance, surfing the web, finishing the book. And I said, I gotta see that bowl in person, in real. And, and lo and behold, I got to go into the, these storerooms behind armed, guard, armed guards and I got to hold that bowl. And that was the scariest moment in my life because I was afraid I'd drop it. Okay, there, okay, I've got to talk about this quickly, but that's what blew my mind away. Uh, who in the, well, I'm not even going to ask. We don't have time. But it, I've asked all over the world, thousands and thousands of people, Chinese, Japanese, 
What does that, boil, what does that say? And they say, it says cha zhanzi, which means tea bowl, tea bowl. <coughs> Everybody says that, but guess what? This is for Norbert. It says tu zhanzi, bitter herb bowl. It's not cha, it's got, if you, you see it's got an extra stroke up there. That's tu, and it means bitter weed, and that goes back to the Book of Odes, the sixth century BC. That's what the plant probably was a thousand, two or three hundred years earlier it was considered to be a bitter weed. It was used in medicine in southwest China. I, I don't have, you read my appendix, okay, if you want to know more. Read the appendix, it's all in there. Um, okay, so that's one important thing, linguistic aspect of this inscription, that the character for tea is not really tea. It says bitter weed. I'm letting that sink in. Okay, the other important thing about this inscription is it's, it doesn't say cha jan. Jan means bowl. It doesn't even say tu jan. It says cha jan zi, tu jan zi. Now guess what? The fact that it ends with that suffix zi means that it's vernacular. It is not classical. So that means that this kind of uh, tea drinking grew up in a vernacular environment because no classical Chinese writer would ever say zhanzi. That is a nominal suffix for vernacular spoken language. And it's very much used in Zen, Chan, Chan um, dialogues, Yulu, go, Goroku. So this is where people spoke like that in a Zen environment, in a vernacular environment. Okay, so I, th I think the person who wrote this was just, maybe he was one of the earliest tea drinkers, but he was writing tea when it was still pronounced tu and written like it's bitter weed. It was at the transitional stage. Okay, I'm just gonna show you some of the other designs. Uh, that's probably a stupa, more swastikas. There's uh, the trigrams of the I Ching on a mirror. And this is how they packed them. They packed these big uh, urns full of them, uh, uh, chock full. full. That's, that's how they were protected. There, there's a scene in the storeroom. And here's me giving a lecture in Singapore about that bowl just after I held it. That was a, one of the thrills, okay. And so now I'm gonna very, very quickly just show that uh, what tea became in Europe, and um, I want to make one comment. I don't think we would have the current president-elect if it hadn't been for tea, because he basically was elected by the Tea Party. <laughs> and there wouldn't be a Tea Party if there hadn't been the original Tea Party in Boston, and we know why that happened. And it has to do, yes, with the Opium War, too. That's very complicated but I can tell you all about it in the Q&A or personally afterward. President Trump owes his election to tea. Okay, this shows you these um, teapots uh, with some Europeans pretending to be Chinese. This is chinoiserie, you know, made for the European trade. And some of them are pretty scandalous. If you look carefully, the guy is leering. And you know, they're pretending they're Chinese scholars or Chinese people in a rural scene. I'm going quickly. He's looking at some part of her anatomy. There you go. Now, I'm just going to the last one. OK, this is how I'm going to conclude. That's an inside painted snuff bottle from about, uh, well, the late Qing Dynasty. 
and why this is so important as a motif. The little boy, the servant, is heating up some water for tea. The gentleman is, I think Tea Master Ip knows who that gentleman is, it is Lu Yu, the guy who invented tea drinking in China. You can ask me about him in the question and answer period. That, we wouldn't be drinking tea probably if it weren't for that man who says tea drinking is not barbarian. It's something good. He was the first tea master. Thank you.